Well, so Michael and I are here to kind of catch up. I don't, we have, we don't really have an explicit plan for this conversation. So we're just going to kind of go where things go. I know we had one of the things that we might talk about is we've both been reading uh, David Bentley Hart's new book, You Were Gods on Nature and Supernature. Um, so that might come up or might something else might come up. So what's, what have you been thinking about since last time we talked, Michael? Um, well, it's a very interesting book. I'm, I'm, uh, it, it seems like I find this, this whole topic super interesting because I don't know, it seems to scrape on something really fundamental in terms of this distinction between, I guess, I mean, it, 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 it's framed as grace versus nature, but really the larger issue is God versus creation, right? Right. Like how, how do those two things relate to one another? Um, in what ways are they distinct and in what ways are they, um, you know, um, always a part of each other. And, um, at the end of like the last conversation we had, um, <clears throat> I don't know, I got to this place, I've gotten to this place recently where I feel like the best way to, to think about our, our relationship to God is sort of like we are, um, it's like God is writing a story. We're like an, um, an, an author, like he's the author and we're, um, we're the creation of that story. And, and in a certain sense, um, if God were ever to stop doing that, you know, ever to stop regarding us or giving us the, the mental space to, to operate within, we would cease to be like, there's, there's that kind of fundamental level of dependence between us and him. But, in but at the same token, there's, and we were talking about this as well, that there's a sort of active sacrifice that has to occur on, on any, we, we experience this as well, you know, both, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm experiencing this now as a parent in terms of like, even though there's, there's some level of sacrifice that's necessary to allow that fictional character or whatever thing that is that you're, if you're in, or even if you're just making a painting to allow the, the painting to, to come into its own being in some sense that, that allow that, that in a certain sense, like, has it does have this sort of independence from you even though um it um it, it is in some sense coming from you so um i don't know if that makes sense i i had uh, there was a there was a quote in the um the nicholas of cusa um, chapter two yeah yeah that I might be able to. I think I sure if you have yeah brought it up. up. Um, Do you know what section it's in? Um, it's in the final bit where he's talking about the Christology of. Nicholas oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's a great. That's a great section. Yeah, that's right. Um, right toward the very end. Yeah, it's where he talks about. I, maybe I didn't highlight it, but he's talk. It's he, he's talking about. Okay, here it is. It's he says, and in the the finite nature that is drawn, I see the infinite nature that is drawing. And so, what's interesting there is like I, I don't know, like I don't know if it was purposeful in in um because Dave Bentley Hart is translating a, a Latin phrase there when into English. But like that use of the word draw, like, I don't know, like the, it has multiple kind of connotations of both, uh, you know, we have like the artist drawing a line, but also this sort of pulling forward um, into, into being. And, yes. um, and so, but he's also, he's also making this, I mean, the point that the larger point that uh, David Britton Hartley is making this all in is, is in the sense that the the human and divine natures of god aren't aren't these sort of things that are smashed together sort of unnaturally just kind of hold together but that there's something there's something about those two things that fit together in a very natural way that um kind of would presume that there is 
something in 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 the divine nature that is essentially human as well such yeah, that he, those two uh, things he also talks he also uses the mirroring language which we keep coming up and we've been circling around that for a while in some of our discussions like most specifically in the one that we had with the wayne mm -hmm. um so um that 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 divinity is not completely foreign to the human nature yeah um it couldn't be that's like that's 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 why that's why christ can be the god man and those two things can exist within him without contradiction yeah and it's right there in the genesis account right let it let us make man in our own image um but like what that what what that image is is uh is debated endlessly but i think it has to mean something there has to be something continuous and direct that that i think um that's i don't know i always like to think about it in in a sense of um of sort of uh this this data compression where like there's some way in which even though we are finite we always you know as, as augustine says we always have this sort of god-shaped hole in us we're always desiring the infinite and that's really what the, the whole this thing entire is. chapter is about yeah, yeah about how how our rational will is is uh, is is properly and naturally directed toward the infinite yeah, um, and it, and if that weren't the case, then all these other things, in in a certain sense, that's the only way any of our desires have any meaning at all, mm -hmm. is that they are grounded ultimately in some ultimate good, and 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 in such as such, we only desire anything else in re, in their relationship to that ultimate good, the infinite itself, and I don't think it's a finite me, it's a finite participation in the infinite right so um it, yeah, or i mean he he uses the i mean he uses the being becoming distinction in this section like quite a bit which is which is one that i prefer to which is why i say that like process theology is at least half right like because this the, the, because the, cre the the creaturely existence is a becoming it is in process it is a drawing toward Mm -hmm. the finite being drawn toward the infinite but yet at this but but you're right to point that that somehow paradoxically it still contains the infinite and 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 it has to right because god fills all things so that yeah. means that like <laughs> god is in everything ultimately um yeah that's how we exist um so any any thoughts on how like uh, I know that I know that you have uh, a, a love of Barfield, and any any thoughts on how like Barfield's thinking about participation might speak to speak to this? Yeah, because um, it seems like Barfield is trying to what Barfield is working toward is kind of like. Uh, a phenomenological observation of the fact like trying to wake people up into seeing that this is actually how we experience reality when we get past the, our our alpha thinking right yeah um i don't know like when, when i think about how yeah, I've had a tough time. Like I've uh, like be, even before I could even tell you what Barfield was going on about, I always had this weird sort of intuition about the importance of of him. And like it was mm -hmm. so strange because um I, I I had no real articulation of it, but just was like, okay, there's something and I and I still today as much as I've read him and reread him struggle to to go to to articulate it because i feel like it is it is it is such a fundamental level it because it is it is about it's ultimately about human consciousness itself and the ways in which human consciousness are fundamental to the nature of reality you know, as such that there and and as such 
specifically related to the nature of God and, and what's going on within the unfolding of the cosmos. And, and so you just mentioned process theology, which I've, I've not really dug deep into that. I, I'd be curious to hear, um, you know, your thoughts on, on the people you've read that you've found compelling in that area. But it does, it does seem to me like, again, going back to this analogy of, of God as an author who is in some sense always and forever laying down his life for the creation so that it, it doesn't just do what he says. It, it has its own being. And yet he is at the same time drawing and directing I think, I think towards this, an ultimate ultimately good. This, I think ultimately this chapter is a good illustration of why process theology is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't think that the, I, the God as envisioned by process theology, I don't think is properly infinite in the way that Kusa is talking about, right? So it's, it's, that's why I say it's half right because, yeah. because our, our, our creaturely existence is in fact, a, it is a process. It is a becoming, but there, but, but God has to be, con, it has to be conceived as as a ground which is not in process <laughs> yeah it is being yeah. itself um so um i don't think it's right ultimately um but i think it has important insights and it's you know it's and i think it's i think ultimately it's an overcorrect i think that process theology is an overcorrection of some of the some of the excesses of the same kind of theology that uh david bentley hart is criticizing in this book which is like the you know the kind of theology that wants to that wants to divide nature and grace as com- two completely separate things, mm-hmm. the theology of a natura pura. Like it's an it's it's kind of an overcorrection against that, but it's just not as I don't think it's as coherent as a more classical. Um, I think I think a more classical theism can overcome that kind of theology and and main maintain more internal consistency and have more explanatory power. Yeah. Well, I think I, I think still read, I still reprocess theologians though. I think what the like, like who, who do you thing. find interesting, compelling that you've read whitehead mostly. Just, yeah. 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 I do think it, it seems like process theology focuses too much on, on that, the ground level of things and not enough on the ultimate that there is something I think it's, I think that process theology, world. process theology never bothers to discard, like it just accepts them, the modern, the modern idea of univocity of being, mm-hmm. it just kind of, it never questions that. So it doesn't think, so it never, it never gets itself back to, to thinking, to thinking in, in terms of the analogia. So I think that's where, that's where it goes wrong, I think. Right. Um, because if 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 we talk if the way we talk about being is univocal and our our being is definitely a process and a becoming mm-hmm. then so would gods have to be yeah right so that so that's what causes them i think to make to be mistaken about the nature of god even though they're right about the nature of creaturely existence right so <clears throat> I think well so if I was going to criticize it like I don't I don't have like the philosophical language to get into the nitty-gritty but like what seems to me what I intuit as the issue with it is that it puts too much control in our it too much it puts too much control in terms of where creation ends up in creation's hands it doesn't it's it um it forgets that there is a real author that has you know um, tremendous capabilities in terms of directing where the story goes. Right. At there, the same time there, that he's you, actually you have, giving... You, yeah, you have no basis for confidence that things are actually being drawn toward their final cause because that final cause itself is just as subject to becoming in process. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because, you know... It, it, process theology kind of moves but, to a point where but, the but God, see the thing is 
here's what's right though is that god does participate in that like he he like or i mean god still indwells everything so there's mm -hmm. a way in which god is involved in that but yep. it is not because god is properly infinite it doesn't exhaust right it doesn't exhaust him right but so there's always something there's always something beyond to draw to draw us using that language that you referenced earlier further up and further in yeah so this seems to be like to be to be the real crux of so many of the 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 conversations we're having today even like even the whole debate around you know like universalism you know mm -hmm. is a debate about it's a debate about how much you know where the balance of free will is like how much free will do we have to go right. ultimately astray from the very ground of being that we're connected to this absolutely touches it because if the argument that david bentley hart makes in this book is correct and there really is and there really is no ultimate separation between nature and grace then universalism mm -hmm. necessarily follows agreed yeah and i would say that i mean creation itself is, is is an act of grace like there's no i mean there's no other explanation for the for the existence of contingent creaturely existence yeah. other than grace what i think too to you have to posit some other form of the good as well that is drawing like that has some positive attraction away from the ultimate good something that has a, again some positive thing whatever you want to call it you know you can call it evil or whatever else but that has some independent positive existence from god that can that can right that has a as enough um yeah you have to you have you you have to have some sort of dualism ultimately and you have to give like evil some kind of positive existence right. as opposed to on this view it's just like you just out of ignorance you mistake you, you mistake lesser goods for ultimate goods yeah what well, exactly and you know you have to you have to have in a certain sense posit those things as like like you said in a dualistic mode where they are ult they 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 become they have an ontological uh equality to the ultimate good mm -hmm. for those for the for it, for it to be that powerful to draw away from from the that's the what idolatry true that's good what I, that's what idolatry is that's now the question i have i mean i don't know if you saw our um any of our uh, meditations on the tarot discussions yeah but, I've in, seen, one, I've seen in, most but in, in one in one of the chapters tom berg suggests that um that idolatry of power is the root of all idolatry right and he says that it, it, it you, you find it in one of two modes you find it in either like the desire to like to be an ubermensch um or what you also see is you see people projecting that like onto god and desiring a god who is a god of power mm. right and which is still to me that ends up turning up turning back into the into the same kind of thing though because you want a god that's bigger than the god of others right mm -hmm. your god is stronger so that you can well, you know the kind of god that you like that leads you to want to conquer and it's in the name of your god right so the god's strength because you're the there's like you you there's some way that the power of the god becomes yours by proxy interesting well and also i think it's a way to win the sort of um you know ideological battle that's me of... that's my that's me not by the way not tomberg that's just me kind of like saying i'm not sure that those are two separate things ultimately i actually think that the god of power is actually just a projection of our desire for being the ubermensch yeah onto our Wait. image of the divine because it... that has nothing to do with actual i mean power has he he talks about how power it's it's in the section the it's in the the letter on the emperor he talks about how authority and power are two entirely different things 
Mm -hmm. because authority, which is ultimately like the name of God is the ultimate authority that is, that requires no compulsion. Yeah. Well, it, it's, so is, is it, help me out real quick. Uh, is yeah. it the ontological argument that states that like God, because is, is the thing that is like the, 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 the best thing that you can conceive of must necessarily exist because it's, can you, yeah, I'm a, trying be, to a, that, a being of which no greater can be conceived. Right. And so in some sense, I feel like those that are trying the power thing is a, is a way of sort of winning squaring off against other people's gods in a way that that picks out one kind of facet of let's say uh of goodness as a way to trump other people's versions of things and therefore mm -hmm. my my god beats your god hence my god's the right god so it's like right. sort of a a way of of um you know setting up something that necessarily beats other people by using very like a, a single facet but it does seem like and this is a hundred percent the god of calvinism like that's why it goes that's why it goes wrong right it's emphasis it, on it's it's emphasis on sovereignty and glory and not understanding how those are those are absolutely contradictory to the god that's revealed in the crucified and by the way as at, th this is this is why i connected it here like heart is really clear in this chapter and, and, and kusa is it, 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 using using kusa to explain this that like there is no other way of knowing god than through christ yeah so christ, well, the, it, there's no there's no observation of christ that leads you to a god who is all about his absolute sovereignty and glory in a way that has anything to do with power right well, or, I, I, or that would see himself glorified in the in the arbitrary suffering and damnation of things that only exist because he called them out of out of himself into existence in the first place. Hold on, hold on one no second. No problem. Sorry. So, after our brief interruption, we're kind of, we're back here, um, and I was just talking about how like that's ultimately this is this is the kind of this is kind of the god that has developed in you know certain branches of reformed theology it's not certainly not just calvin um and yeah and and for that version to be coherent you have to i think you have to say that whatever the consequences are specifically willed by god right mm -hmm. i mean because otherwise and will and will which is the will to power ultimately is the primary attribute of this God, which makes it by definition an idol. If you understand the difference between authority and power, and if you understand that the only way for you to know God at all is through the crucified one. Yeah. And that's not the picture that you get of God at all. So which I ultimately, which, which is why, this is why I find it, which is why I find it's talk about total depravity, ultimately just false humility and obsequiousness. It really is just like, you know, it's like Luther has the, Luther didn't have total depravity, but all reform theology kind of tends in this direction. Luther has the line about uh, um, us being like, you know, piles of dung, covered in snow by the you know by christ but that's fundamentally like no we're called forth into being by god and created in the image of god what i mean if what we are we we are we are we are we are gold coins that are tarnished right so definitely mm -hmm. i mean we we are fallen there is sin there is healing that needs to happen. I won't deny that, but our nature is not shit. Yeah. <laughs> we are created it, by it, it, we're created by God. If we if our nature was shit, then God makes then that then that makes God shit because God is the ultimate source of 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 our being. It, it does seem, though, in some way, that that framing has won the day, right? 
Yes, it is because people are so crappy to each other. But the thing is, is that we ignore, we, we tend to, I have, we had this, this came up in my estuary group. This was a really, my friend Jeff like made this observation. Like he actually, this is actually a thing he's done with his students and his, he, te he teaches sociology um, uh, at the collegiate level and, or has, he's not currently. Um, and he would do this experiment where he would like ask these questions about like human nature of his students. And they would like 89% of them would like answer in a very negative way that would have this like culturally Calvinist sort of total depravity almost view of what human nature is like. Right, and even for would, people that are, are secular, right? And then he would, yes, exactly. Even for people who are secular, this is just like the cultural default assumption mm -hmm. for North Americans, period, across the board. Then he would have them actually go watch children playing and ask them the same question and it, it would radically shift. It would radically shift when they actually like watch children at play and watched how, oh, they actually are naturally kind to each other. They naturally do cooperate. And even when we think back, and this is, this is an observation I made when he said that, and like, we just have this tendency to focus on the negative, which I think is part of our fallenness, right? So if you look at back at your own childhood memories, it's like your tendency is to remember the negative things too, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, you might remember the fight you had with your best friend that lasted five minutes and caused you to agonize over it, but forget like the other three hours that you were playing together with no problems. Yeah. And just focus on that one little brief, you know, conflict. So yeah, it's just, uh, it's a failure of imagination. It's a failure of observation. It's just, um, yeah. And I mean, we have a, ten and it leads us toward a lot of like really weird decisions. It's like, it's why we think we need to use, it's, it's why we think we need to use power to compel people. Well, we have to use power to compel people because everyone's bad. So the only thing that's going to keep them in line is the threat of force. So that's just the way it is. But real authority doesn't, doesn't resort to, doesn't resort to that kind of, you know, raw, like force or compulsion. Yeah. It, 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 it it's inherently, a, it's compelling in an erotic kind of way like real authority, right? It's, it does compel you, but it compels you from the inside out. It draws you toward it is what it does. Yeah, I definitely agree. Well, I mean, I think anybody that, you know, if you're a parent, like, you know, that like, if, if you, you had situation A where, you know, you're, you you got your your child to do something that was quote unquote you know positive in some way and it was accomplished via like literally like pushing them and prodding them and like slapping them anytime they got out of line and just like at the end of the day they did a but only because of um with the, the threat of force at every juncture you know of right but this doesn't involved. mean that you, but you can still exercise authority you can exercise authority over your child without exercising power and compulsion mm -hmm. over your child and you can and, and and the root of authority is in fact love like that's what gives you authority is actually like being able to show to someone that you actually care about them as a person like they will learn that over time and learn to respect that that's what's going on. Yeah. And we, we, we seem inherently, if you look at, you know, the, the kind of architecture of stories that seems to be there, even in, even in relatively poor stories, um, that, that architecture of authority being linked to love, I think you can find pretty, mm -hmm. pretty consistently. Right. 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 So then, so then the question is how, how has it come that there's this, this sharp divide in terms of the, the culture at large being so um, taken up with this. Um, everyone's, everyone is fighting over divide. power. It's not yeah. just, it's not like, so, I mean, everyone on all sides wants power over the other side and thinks it knows best. 
so it has to do with like it has to do with the way i mean it it, it also is tied up with like the the way we think about knowledge mm. if you think about like the kind what like, there's a there's a there's a i quoted it on twitter earlier today but there's a part in chapter two where um i think it one was hold on a second see if i can find it i think it's on page 31 where Hart says uh uh okay well i'll just paraphrase it because i can't find it but he essentially he he talks about like that the rational will ultimately is moved toward um the toward uh properly moved toward the infinite which which is which is like being and know being and knowing in a single act um um and then he says then he follows that up with, oh, I wish I had, I wish I had highlighted it. I was at the doctor's office and didn't have a highlighter. Uh, I want to get it right. Bear with me just one moment. I know approximately where it's at. It's right before, uh, let's see. Okay, I skipped over it. My eyes skipped over it like several times. I finally got it though. The rational will therefore can rest content only in that infinite divine simplicity where being and knowing are one event perfected in the repletion of love. So. What do you think about that? Yeah, it seems like. There, there seems to me some link in terms of <clears throat> conceptions related to knowledge around like, you know, the, the, the Descartes, you know, move of, of radical self-doubt as a means of, of creating real knowledge. Um, and this sort of, this, ten, this sort of tendency as well towards, um, thinking of ourselves as kind of scummy and beneath everything and tending to have as a default presupposition of seeing other people that way as well. Um, and that there's sort of like, it's almost like there's this sense in that, that everything is contaminated in some way and that right. you're the, the act of well, knowledge it separates, creation it is some sort of, it's it, it's the move to separate knowledge out for itself which is really i mean this is the temptation in the garden to know to have the knowledge of good and evil yeah it's, it's to like, separate self it is the separation of knowledge as something independent like i've said before there, there in some of our conversations before i've said this it's like evil has no ontology only in epistemology mm. right well because the thing is is that real knowing is not epistemological. I mean, like Aquinas says that all knowledge is all knowledge of being. It's the move to separate to separate knowledge independently, as if it were a category separate from being and loving, that causes us this, you know, corrupt move toward power, instead of being, in, you know, in proper hierarchical alignment on the under the divine authority of love. Right. Because there's no way to, you can't use, you can't use it. What well, seems but that like, doesn't mean, but that well, doesn't mean it's not useful. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, it, I mean, <laughs> you, you can, but it's like it's. Um, I think we we fail to uh, apprehend what the 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 consequences of of quote unquote using it and and but it 
this this sort of crystallized knowledge that's divided it's um like you said it's useful it's just um it leads it, it leads you to some weird places you know um like let's hear about the weird places um well i think i think just in terms of not i i mean for me i guess i immediately think of sort of the the ecological crises that mm. are kind of coming to the fray now because they are um they're not taken into there there isn't a way we haven't figured out ways to crystallize knowledge around them even even the the, the attempts to kind of well but talk how but, about, but look at how we're but look at how we're fundamentally relating to an our environment our environment though right it's, it's like it we're, is. it's how can we use it what yeah. can it what can it do for us there's rather than just an appreciation that it, and a gratitude that it exists that's why, and, which, and I, I don't, I don't mean to, I don't, I don't want to come off as if I'm hostile to science. I, that, that was another great discussion that came up in, in one of our meditations of the tarot section, where like Tomberg is like proposing the idea of suggesting that we have a different kind of science that rather than being, rather than being based on, you know, the principles of destruction which basically all of our energy sources that we've developed to date are. Mm -hmm. He said he's, he, he invites us to imagine instead um, a science that is, that is, that is based on, you know, the, up, upon the principles of life. Right. So he talks about, he, he talks about like uh, an oak, uh, uh, like uh, um, an acorn as like a kind of a reverse nuclear bomb that gives way to the explosion of an oak tree. But it's an explosion of movement towards life instead of a movement towards destruction and, and death. And if, and I think that part of our, part of what motive, what part of what causes us to move in that direction is actually a failure to, ex, a, of thinking our own finitude and limitedness too much and not realizing that our rational will is actually properly directed toward the infinite and our existence is a participation in the infinite and therefore the lim the limits that we impose on ourselves may be more arbitrary than we than we suspect yeah which is kind of what we talked i don't did you i don't know if you were in were you in the loaves and fishes discussion we had months ago no but i i, Where, I did watch okay. it because i think that's like to me this is what this is this is what it, it was the verse in mark's gospel where jesus laments the fact that the disciples did not understand about the loaves and in the context of the scriptures this is like immediately after like jesus is just like performed the miracle of multiply multiplying the loaves and fishes walked on water and right before like the um before that before he says that like they're worrying about their resources and how and how finite and limited their resources are and then jesus like laments that they didn't understand and i think that's what he's talking about he's like w we part of our part of our lust for power is related to us thinking that god doesn't provide that god isn't truly infinite that we're left to our own finite devices to try to fulfill our infinite desire and then we misdirect we idolatrously misdirect those desires toward things that are not that are not are that are not its truly proper infinite end and get ourselves into trouble. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, definitely. Well, it's 
I was thinking too, when you say, you know, when you talk about this sort of infinite quality, it also means that we, it, the, our capacity to get so far afield is, is rather infinite as well. Because, um, well, I guess I, what I'm still kind of trying to square is these mm. sort of, the ways in which divine and human agencies are squaring off against each other. And what are the, you know, I, I think about like, you know, this Nicholas Sakuza talks about like this sort of infinitely large circle that almost to, to the, the finite perspective looks like a straight line. It does. It looks like it's never going to return to itself. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's elements of that in looking at, you, you think about like the the recapitulation of all things, um, you know, the, of, of of the creation returning to its source in in a in the way it's supposed to. I, it's like, it, I do think about how far can it roam a field before, in the process of that, mm. um, and um. <sighs> I don't know. It's in in terms of just trying to make sense of of the moment we're in right now and where we're at and where we're where we're likely to be, like say ten years from now. Um, um, I don't know. It's um, I do think we have to. You always have to have a a sense of of hope, but realize that the short term, the ways in which, which that, uh, that manifest can be, you know, I mean, we've talked about this before, but like the, a very much a, a sort of devolution of, of everything that you think is, is solid and uh, sacred even. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's kind of, and that's kind of like where we are, like in our time is like, we're in a, you know, it's like uh, we're in the Cayuga, we're in the Iron Age, um, and uh, but I think the question from a Christian perspective is, is like, um, it, you know, I think is is it is it is it a is it cyclical or is it uh, or is it apocalyptic or and all well and then. Like, are the cyclical and apocalyptic actually in tension? And then I have, and then when you, I'm really bringing up a lot of stuff here. Sorry. I'm just kind of going with what's coming. Um, and then, of course, one of the questions I always ask myself is like, we have a, okay, in the West, we tend to have an, a tendency toward, definitely that's toward fertility for, for toward the future some, some kind of progress yep. and that has been for like most of western christian history that's kind of how we have viewed like time implicitly like i mean i know that we i mean there's a ten, there's a christian tendency it's like, like to, to not to, to try to avoid immunitizing it but there's mm -hmm. still like it history is moving toward a definite resolution yeah um a golden age so, right but it's not but not a but it's like it's an, a never-ending golden age it's not a it's, it's not a cycle right it's yeah. a it's a so it's it's maybe maybe we have to have maybe we have to that basically it's the it, there's an end to the cycle that you have and like you know traditions that have more of a cyclical view of time so the question is is that I, does that really mess with eternity though? Like to me, it seems to me that like any, that any apocalypse, any real apocalypse mm -hmm. has to be in the now. Like if you don't learn to, I, I, what I'm saying is if you, if you don't, if you don't learn mm -hmm. to, if you don't learn to live into your, you know, your eschatological destiny now, I don't know. I mean, 
I mean, unless there's reincarnation, which suggests more cyclical time. I don't know. It's just <laughs> so, but it it doesn't. Uh, yeah, I, I wonder sometimes with the if whether the future is real. Hmm. Let's, let's, let's speak more on that. Well, I mean. it's to me like the the future is kind of like i think the thing that keeps us from rest i think that this idea of the future and being oriented toward the future and mm-hmm. I, this is one of the things that bothers me about jordan peterson when he talks about like sacrificing for your own future i think mm-hmm. that's the fundamentally wrong orientation like i don't think we should be looking to the future because the future is like the fu- if you're looking toward the future you're perpetually like delaying you're resting in god like you're never you're you're never you're never you're never yeah you're wanting to you want it's 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 a game of perpetual delay yeah i i yeah I fundamentally agree, but I'm, and, and, I'm and, torn. Right. And the, and the most profound spiritual experiences that, that I have had and the most profound, that profound spiritual experiences that most people report are very much like one of presence. Right. So I don't know. Um, didn't mean to, it, it always gets, mind bending when we start talking about I know right time but I, I mean it's like yeah it feels like this is yeah what you're you've stretched on here is really important I don't it's like I don't have a good lens into how to pull it apart and I actually do have to drop at the top of the hour here um no no I problem I understand yeah um but yeah I think we can leave know. that to explore next time. Yeah, I'd be curious if you have any other. I, I don't know. I think I think there's definitely something there, and I don't know how to. I don't have the the right philosophical toolkit to start breaking it apart. But I, I do feel like well, that's I'm not also saying... rela- Go ahead. It's also related to what I was talking about that 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 idea of um, sort of uh, us being in a a work of fiction or or a, you know a work of art that's that's being uh, supported and aimed at through the, this artistic process that we are kind of co-collaborators, co-collaborators in. So there is, <clears throat> I, I don't know, there's some, yeah, there's something there that I think is really important. I don't know how to put it into words, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a think on it and see if I can, Sure. Put yeah. Well, maybe maybe words. the maybe the next time we met, we can talk about that. We can talk about like um, the proper relationship, um, wh- whether we should be oriented toward the future or oriented toward the toward eternity, and how those things differ. Yeah. I don't think I they're think the that's... same thing. Yeah, I etern- absolutely agree. Eternity touches every moment, and is available to access at any moment. Yeah. Apocalypse now. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) (laughs) So thanks for joining me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah.